to go to me, with me to the book of First Samuel, chapter number one. We're going to do a, a lot of reading, maybe more reading than you're used to. But this is going to provide context for today's message. Are you ready? Good. Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the temple. Hannah was in deep anguish crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish. And sorrow. In that case, Eli said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah, where Alcan Al Al oh, sorry, y'all, Elkanan slept with. Hannah, his wife, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel. For she said, I asked the Lord for him. When, when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. And after sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, Eli's the priest, Sir, do you remember? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Can we pray? Father, thank you. For this service so far thank you for this wonderful group of people who are here in purpose person and those who are watching online would you speak and minister to our hearts today as only you can in jesus name amen amen i want to speak to you this morning from the subject a burdened mother a burdened mother and if i could give you a subtitle it would be keep it on the altar tell somebody next to you say keep it on the altar the Bible is, is full of stories of incredible moms, mothers who have, in their childbearing, have given birth to people who have shaked the kingdom. But there would be no shaking of the kingdom without moms who were burdened by the Lord to raise children to love and serve the Lord. I mean, you can look through all the pages of scripture. You can look at Jacobed, Moses' mother, and see the great sacrifice she made by taking her son, putting him in a basket, and pushing him down the river. Uh, if you want to go into the New Testament, there is that Seraphonician woman, that woman who, who cried out to Jesus despite being uh, a castaway, despite being a person who maybe shouldn't have been talking to Jesus, being that he was a Jew and also that she was a, a Gentile and a woman, but yet she, she, she cries out. She cries out on behalf of her daughter. And and the pages of scripture are full of stories like that where moms have cried out because they've been burdened with the responsibility of mothering a child. It's one thing to be a mom. It's one thing to be a mom that is burdened with the responsibility of parenting a child. And again, the Bible is full of these stories. And one story in particular that I like to focus our attention on this morning would be the story of a woman by the name of Hannah. 
Now, what's exciting about this story is that Hannah wanted children for a long time and couldn't have it. She, she, she desired it, but, but it just wasn't working. And she had a husband who loved her despite the fact that she was not able to bear children. Um, but yet there was something in Hannah that said, this is what I desire of the Lord. And in the passage we just read, uh, we get a bird's eye view into a moment of anguish that, that Hannah was having. Hannah was so burdened with the desire to mother a child that she began to do the only thing she knew that could make a difference, and that is she began to cry out to God. How many know that, that, that when there's nowhere else to turn, you can always turn to Jesus? I want you to catch that in your spirit. When there's nowhere else to go, when you have exhausted every medical expert, when you have exhausted all of your resources, we find this theme over and over again in the scriptures. When you have nowhere else to go, you can turn to God. And that's what Hannah's doing. She is praying, but she's praying not like regular, cute, rub-a-dub-dub, thank you for the grub prayers. No, no, Hannah is burdened with prayer. And she's crying out, have you ever, ever seen somebody pray like that? Yes, have you ever witnessed a mom who was burdened with the sickness of a child or even the death of a child? As a pastor, I've eulogized many folks and stood there as moms grieve over caskets uh, that contain the remains of their lifeless child. And if you want to hear a cry, if you want to hear a cry that you'll never forget, it's to hear a mom weeping over her child. That's the mode that Hannah is in in this particular passage. She is weeping for a child she doesn't even have yet. She's crying out to the God that she knows can perform miracles. And in that anguish, she said some things that are so important to our prayer life, not just hers. She said, Lord, if you grant my request, if you grant my request, I promise if you give me a boy that I'll give that child right back to you. I promise, Lord, if you give me this child, this child will be dedicated to you. And, and here's how I'll prove it. He'll never see any of his hair cut. He'll ma we'll make this vow to you that we're going to honor you in this way. I want you to, to just put a little bookmark right there. Hannah makes a promise to God in her prayer. Can I say this? Be careful what you promise God when you pray. Y'all yes, wow. with me? Anybody ever made some promises to God while you're crying out in anguish for him to do something? You're like, Lord, if you just get me out of this, I promise. Yeah, I See, I'm going to try this side. They're lying over here. You ever pray one of those prayers? Lord, if you don't, let it go. Just please, Lord, I promise I'll be at church on Sunday. Some of you are following up on that thing you promised in prayer this week. I'm glad you're here. Praise God for you. But Hannah begins to cry out, and in her crying out, she makes these promises to God. Now, I want to go back to her crying out. She's crying out, and her lips are moving, but nothing's coming out of her mouth. Y'all remember some, some R&B singer said, I'm all cried out. How many of you have ever been all cried out? You did. You're talking about anguish hits you where nothing is coming out, but your soul is crying. And she's doing it right near the temple. And the pastor is walking by. And he's like, why are you going to come here with all that foolishness? Why are you drunk? You know you got to be crying out something fierce for someone to walk by and think you're drunk. When's the last time you cried out like that to God? Where it didn't matter who was looking at you. It didn't matter their perception of you. All you wanted to do was do everything you could to get God's attention. That's how Hannah is crying out. And the preacher, the, 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 the priest of the day, Eli, comes through and sees it. And he begins to look at her and says, girl, get your wine and get out of here. How are you going to come to church drunk? And she says, no, 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 man of God. I am not drunk. I am anguished. I'm in pain. I am praying with great desperation. You see, I've been trying to have a child all these years, and no matter what we do, nothing seems to happen. 
So I've come to the place where I'm going to lean into the only one who can fix it. And I believe he hangs around this place. I believe this temple is where he's supposed to reside. He's supposed to come here. So I thought if I can get a little closer to the altar and I can lay my burdens on the altar of God, that he, the God who, who sits high but looks low might uh, incline his ear to my request and he may answer me. And Eli is so cool, which I just think is just a cool part of scripture because Eli's like, oh, since you said that, do you notice when you read it in scripture, it's like a quick turnaround. It wasn't like this, like, I'm going to warm up to it. He's just like, oh, so you're crying for that? Hey, may the Lord grant everything that you've been praying for. How many of you prayed a long time for something and didn't hear nothing? And then all of a sudden you could just feel something in your spirit saying, everything I've been praying for is going to come to pass in my life. It does something to you. And the Bible says that she goes home and she eats and she goes and she's happy. She don't even have the baby yet. I just wish on this Mother's Day I had three mamas that have some church with me. She didn't even have the baby yet, but she's already happy because you don't have to have the thing manifest if you get a word from God. When you get a word from God, it's a sure thing. You can take that to the bank. Come on, I wish some... How many of you have learned to find contentment without the thing you've been praying for? And you say, how did I learn? Because I heard God say that he's going to do. Where did you hear him? Did he say it all we know? I read it in his word. He said the promises of God are both yes and amen. I read in his word that all my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches. And are y'all with me? So I can walk around, I can walk away empty handed, but not empty hearted. <laughs> I wish somebody, <laughs> you've got to learn that part of this Christian journey is some days you'll walk away empty handed, but your heart will be full of faith and joy and peace, knowing that God is good for his word. He'll do what he said he's going to do. That's the God I serve. I don't know about you, but the God I serve, he's, he's not slack concerning his promises. As a matter of fact, if he says that he has to do it, he's on the hook for it because he's not a man that he should lie. And it's so, he's so crazy good that when he speaks a thing, it has to come to pass. You know God can't say something without it coming? Because his speech is creative in its nature. My God, that's how, 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 how much we can trust God at his Words. So she, she leaves that place with great joy. And then, and then she, you know, uh, help me, Jesus. There's a part of this whole miracle that's very natural. And oftentimes when people are praying for miracle, we forget that we still got to go back and do what we're supposed to do. There was no Holy Spirit coming into Hannah's womb. Y'all come up, y'all. She had to go home and put into practice what had come through a promise. You have to practice the promise before you ever see that thing manifested. You can imagine if this couple had been trying for children all this time, that there would have been this like almost frustration to say, we're going to do this again. We've been trying this all these years. What's the difference now? The difference now is I got a word from the Lord. And because I have a promise, I'm going to go back home and practice. I wish I'm going to use the word practice. There's enough kids. There. I'm going to use the word practice. They need to go home and to practice the promise so that the. Pro now, I know it's a little uncomfortable subject, but there are things that God has promised you that you have to remain in practice while you. You have to keep doing what God called you to do, even if you don't see the fulfillment of everything that he said. You have to practice it. You don't just sit there and wait for it to fall on your head. No, you wake up every single day, put one foot in front of the other, and walk out the will of God for your life. Because his word is a lamp unto my feet, y'all. His word will guide me into the place of promise. Come on, y'all. The reason I'm still practicing without having seen it manifest is that I got a promise. 
reason why you still are saying God's going to do it. And it's been eight years and people are looking at you like it's been eight years. Give it up. Get a new plan. Get a new idea. You're like, you don't understand. I'm not practicing an empty practice because I got a promise that's connected to my practice. And if I keep just doing what God told me to do, one of these days I'm going to walk in to what he said. It might not be right away. I'm preaching to somebody who feels like all you're doing is waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm tired of waiting. Well, if you wait the right way, eventually, eventually God's going to show up. This ain't the message. I'm almost there with the mama points. This part of the message has got me excited. It really did. It's a reminder to me that God's th that our waiting is never wasted. And he just has practices. So, so, so Hannah goes home, finds her husband. They practice. They practice and then the promise comes and they have a child. Now you could imagine, mamas, I've seen y'all. I've had five of my own. There's something about a mom when they put that baby on that mother's chest, that skin to skin, and the way y'all look at that baby, like, try something, I'll get you. <laughs> like, sound like the Terminator when they talk. It's crazy, y'all. Something about those babies. And they're so precious to you, moms. Moms, you know the way they smell. You can smell your babies. Your, your babies aren't babies no more, and you still remember. Some of y'all getting it right now. Mom's like, he stinks now, but he used to smell so good. Come on. <laughs> y'all remember that, mamas? So, so, so she, she's got her baby, and she's, she's got the promise. She's got the promise she's been praying for. She's got the promise that she didn't think was ever going to happen. But the problem is that she made a promise while asking for the promise. She told the Lord, if you give me this baby, I won't keep him for myself. Now, I know that sounds super spiritual to be like, you could have him. Oh, it's hard to give something back. Let, let, me, let, me, let me give you this point. The point is, remember the promises you make to God in prayer. You got to remember the promises you make to God in prayer. If there's a lesson that Hannah will teach us and that we can learn from her life is this, that when you make a promise to God in prayer, remember the promise. You see, her journey with this child started at the altar and it needed to end there as well. It's amazing to me the things that I've asked God to bring into my life. And then when he brings it into my life and I told him I was going to do it this way and use it this way, personal desires can cloud everything that I promised him in prayer and how I now want to use it a different way, a way that pleases me a little more. And I forgot the fact that the only reason he probably gave me the promise is because I told him I was going to give it back to him. And here's the thing, it's so important for us to learn as we're praying these big prayers in life, understand this, that anything that God gives you still belongs to him. Uh, I'm going to say that one more time. Anything that God gives you still belongs to him. And if you're not willing to freely give to God what he has freely given to you, then you might want to check how you're praying. Yeah. See, Hannah teaches us. She says she, she, she has this child, and the Bible says she weans the child. And after weaning the child, she then gets the child grabs a bull, grabs some bread, and the bull was for a sacrifice. They wanted to bring an offering to God's house that was a, a separate sacrifice or an animal sacrifice alongside with the child that they promised they would dedicate to the Lord. So she goes back to Eli's house. She goes back to church, knocks on the door. Preacher man, it's me, the crazy lady. The lady whose lips was moving but nothing was coming out. And he's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. You look a lot better now. That's not in the Bible. I made that up. She says, I'm here with that child God gave me. I'm here because in my prayer, in my crying out to God, I made a promise to him that if he gave me this thing, I'd give it back to you. 
him, back to him. So here is my son. He is ready for service in the kingdom of God. And there Hannah drops off her child, offering him up to this strange preacher man because it was a promise she made to God. Oh, y'all, I read through that passage and I've known this story. My mama taught me this story in Sunday school, but it hit me different this time because I realized I need to learn to be careful with the promises that I make to God in prayer. I need to not be just saying things in order to, to get to try to manipulate God as if you can manipulate the God who knows all things. But we try to manipulate him, not realizing that God can see through all of that mess. He can see our heart and whether or not we're willing to do that. And I'm saying to this, this to you, brothers and sisters, this morning, there are some things that you have on the altar of God. That the reason they're not released is because if he gave it to you, you'll be consumed with it. If he gave it to me, there's a good chance that whatever it is he gave to me will quickly become an idol and not a point of uh, uh, not something that I can look to God and give him glory for. So the key to this moment in Hannah's life is that she has made up in her mind. I want this child, but I'm willing to give it back to God if it means having to do that. And that's exactly what she does. She sends him to the house of Eli and he is raised up in the priesthood. He becomes the priest over Israel. He's the man that goes to David and anoints David. He has a rich history in the kingdom of God, but it starts with a mom who was willing to just be burdened by God. It starts with a mom who put that child, rather, who, who, who saw that child come to life as a result of being on the altar and a mom who said, I'm going to keep him on the altar for the rest of his life. See, I want you to think, consider this in your prayer life, in your time with God, in your requesting of God. How much of the things are you asking for will you bring back and place on the altar? Moms that are in the room today, I want to tell you something. Your kids just don't need to be the gift that you pray for once, but they need to be the children that you keep on the altar of the Lord. Moms, if there's anything that you can do for us, can I tell you, please keep us before the altar of the Lord. I talk to my mom a lot. We talk maybe daily. Uh, and, and, and one thing my mom says, that as we all got older and left the house and we got our own families and our own children, she says, you know what? It's different. I don't worry about if you ate, but I worry about is your family okay? I, there's still this, this sense of concern and I still have you on the altar and she prays like she's prayed before. I'd rather praise different prayers, but it's still the same intensity and passion. And I want to just share that with every mom and every dad in the room for that matter. We've got to keep our children on the altar of the Lord. It's not enough, not enough to ask the Lord to bless us with children. And then we receive the children. We're saying, Lord, thank you. You've been so good. No, no, no. You got to take those same babies, take them back to the house of the Lord and put them on the altar and say, Lord, these are your children. Would you heal them? Would you save them? Would you set them free? Would you protect them, God? Would you help them to know you? Would you, would you be real in their lives? God, I need you to do something with my babies. I want to encourage every person in the room, moms and non-moms in the room, I want to say to you, we got to learn to keep things on the altar. Ooh, that's Hannah. Hannah's keeping things on the altar. Yes, this baby comes as a result of me crying out before the Lord, but guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Even when this child comes, I'm going to put him back on that same altar because only God can keep him. Only God can keep him. Only God can shape his life and only God can set his course. And I want to say this to the moms in the room. We need you praying for your children. So burdened that you'll cry out. So burdened that you'll lay on the floor in your room and lay on their floor in their room and just continue to pray and cry out. Now, I know some of you are like, Pastor, that sounds good, but I've been praying and nothing's changing. My kids are as broken as they've ever been. I'm hurting and I don't know what, what to do. You keep on the altar. You stay on the altar as long as you have to stay. Come on, mamas. Mamas, we need you to... Moms, we need y'all. We need y'all praying again. You know, I'm tired of hearing my grandma used to pray. My great grandma, all these different people from times past. I want to know that there are some moms that God has. Not some, not listen, 
with, with no disrespect to our senior saints, to those of you in your 70s and your 80s, praise God for you. But some of you 25-year-old moms need to learn how to pray, like kind of pray. Some of you 35 and 45, and you got to learn how to lay out for your children. And let me tell you, let me tell you what God will do. While you're praying for them, God will be working on you. While you're praying for them, God will be strengthening your faith. While you keep them on the altar, you find yourself laid up on that altar of sacrifice and God will be doing the fine tuning and surgery in your life, cleaning you up and making you right before him. Mom, we need, we need praying moms. Not again. I believe that there are some in the earth, but I believe there just needs to be a stronger collective effort by all the moms in the house. Stop thinking your prayers don't do anything. No, your prayers advance the enemy's lines and the enemy's pursuit of your children. You got to, mm, come on, church. Make your kids so used to you praying that when they leave the house, they're scared not to, to leave the house without you praying. I don't know if you got kids like that, but my kids, as soon as we go to the parent drop-off line and parent pickup line for school, I'm dropping them off in the morning, and I might be on a phone call with one of the pastors or the elders here, and I'm talking, and my son would be like... I'm not getting out this car until you pronounce a blessing on my life. Not because it's a ritual, but because I believe that when you pray, God comes in the room. That when you pray, he sends his angels and his angels come and keep me protected. I wish there'd be some moms and some dads that keep their children on the altar of God. Oh, but I prayed and they haven't changed. Well, pray some more and pray some more and pray some more because one day you're going to wake up and everything you've been praying for is going to come to pass. I'm praying for my kids. They're depressed. I'm praying for my kids. They're confused. I'm praying for my kids. They're, they're addicted. I'm praying for whatever it is you're praying for. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop praying. You declare God's word over their life every single day. I'm telling you, it has shaped the way they think about life and the way they think about themselves. And they be on their way to do something they know they're not supposed to be doing. And they'll hear your voice. They're like, I can hear my mama reciting scripture over me. I can hear my mama saying, but you can't live like that. And please, God, I know. But they get annoyed. They're annoyed now. They'll thank you later. They're annoyed now, but they'll thank you later. Oh, I know, but I just don't want to aggravate them. I'll oh, stop it. That's the way for the enemy to keep you know, God's word out of their ears. You got to aggravate them a little bit. Listen, to the devil, to who? Jesus, help me right now, Lord. We're worried about, oh, they're going to be a little aggravated. Let them be aggravated. I'm aggravated. When's the last time you looked at your week and you weren't aggravated by something they did? At least what we're doing is constructive. You might be, you know what? You might take what you want, but we're going to pray. We ain't leaving this house until we pray. We ain't getting on this road until we pray. You ain't going to bed without me praying for you. You may get, you may get annoyed, or, or what will happen is they're going to experience the goodness of God in the midst of all those prayers, and they're going to say, you know what, Mom? I'm not leaving until you pray for me. My oldest son, AJ, he's 16. He's going to be so mad now. He's like, Dad, you owe me money. Use me as an example in the message. You owe me something. <laughs> since he was a little guy, since he's a little guy, so funny. He still does it to this day. He, I was trying to pray. He'd be like, that's his prayer pose, y'all. Prayer position. You know, everyone's like, this. Okay. <laughs> My wife and I were, were laying in bed the other night, and AJ comes in the room, and He's at that age, he's got amazing grades. So I don't have, you know, a bunch of rules on him like that. When it comes, hey, listen, you go to school and do your thing, you, you, you're gonna get some, see that, that's the way it works. You do right, you get freedom. You do wrong, you get locked up. Simple as that, that's how it works. Real simple system. <laughs> People make this hard, it's, it's not complicated. <laughs> so he rolls into the room, he's ready to go to sleep, and he comes to bedside, he says, Dad, pray for me. And my wife and I are laying in the bed. And AJ, he's 16 now. He ain't little no more. Still say there. 
but he will not go to bed without his dad blessing him, without me praying a prayer over him. Every single, he will not go to bed. I don't have to go looking for him. He comes looking for me. Those other kids, they'll be in the bed. Dad, you didn't pray. Because if you make it a practice, don't make it a lifestyle. If you make it a practice in your life, you say, well, we don't do it. Start right now. Eventually, it become a lifestyle in your home, and your kids will be like, I can't even go without it. And here, they know it's more than a ritual because they've seen the hand of God on their life. Moms, dads, everybody, every person in the room, your prayer makes a difference. Here's one more thing I'm going to tell you about Hannah. We're out of here. Hannah was persistent in prayer. You don't stop praying because you don't get the answer the first time. Did y'all hear me, church? You don't just stop praying because it doesn't come to pass right away. No, you keep firing that thing up. You keep praying and trusting and believing God. You say, God, I know you're going to make a way. You pray discouraged. You pray angry. Anybody ever pray angry? See, she was bitter. She was weeping. You got to pray angry some days. Angry. Lord, I don't even want to be praying right now, but I'm going to pray because I know it's the right thing to do. And some of you are like, God doesn't honor that kind of prayer. Yes, he does. That is the best kind of prayer because it is you putting your flesh on the cross and saying, I don't want to, but I'm going to do it anyhow because I know your word is true. All church, come on. See, you're waiting to feel good to pray. I'm telling you, you don't have to feel good to pray. You pray because it's right. You pray because it honors God. And when you start to do that, let me tell you, you're going to start to see the hand of God move in your life. What do you mean? How's, listen, he does it in his way. He'll start putting impressions on your heart. He'll start, you'll start finding strength where you, where you were weak before. And you'll think to yourself like, man, this prayer time is really actually working. Now, here's the last one. Hannah prayed for something that was difficult. I want to share this with you. When you pray for a long time for something that's difficult and it doesn't come to pass, you know what happens? The Bible says hope. Uh, th I'm sorry. I lost my, my thought. Y'all pray for me. It's a scripture and, and it's all scrambled in my head right now. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. That's the scripture. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. Here's what that means is, is you're waiting so long that your heart gets sick. And you know what we start doing? We start praying prayers that we're capable of answering. I'm preaching to somebody. We start praying prayers that we can answer ourselves because we can't bear the letdown of praying a big, bold prayer and God not showing up again. So some of us have stopped praying for miracles. I'm talking to some of us. Some of us, it's me. It's not y'all, it's literally me. I'm not going to pray for a miracle because, because everyone said that's impossible. Everyone said that the medical diagnosis is beyond reversal. It cannot be reversed. It, it, so I'm, I'm, I'm scared to pray because I prayed for this before and it didn't come to pass, so I'm not going to pray for it now. So I'm just going to pray for God to... God help me deal with it because I'm scared to pray for the miracle because if I don't get the miracle then I'll be sick again and I just if I can just get numb enough to not think about it am I preaching to somebody that needs to get back to the boldness of prayer where we go before the throne of God with big, bold prayers and say, God, I believe that you can do it. I know the doctor said it's impossible. I know all the experts have spoken against it, but I know that you can do it, God. And Lord, even if I die praying that prayer, I'm content with believing you because I don't know about you. I don't want to live this life believing God halfway. I either want to believe him to do the, the full, complete work or I don't want to believe him at all. So my prayer is for every Hannah out there, male, female, everybody in here, every Hannah out there who has been praying and your hope has been deferred, my prayer is that God will give you the grace to pray big, bold prayers again. My kids will be saved. The sickness that's on my child, in my child's body will be healed. The cognitive, developmental delay gap in my child will be healed. 
I'm preaching boldly now. He is a healer. And I trust him. It might not come in a moment, but we're going to walk this out with God and we're going to see the hand of God bring healing and deliverance to a child that has been suffered with mental illness their whole life. They suffered with mental health crisis. Every, they suffered with thoughts of suicide and cutting. And God is a healer. He can completely heal. And I bring that child before the Lord. That child that is a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter who has run this way and that way. I believe that God can take them out of the clutches of sin and bring them back into the body of Christ. That's my belief. I believe God can do it, so I'm praying for it. He's a healer. Okay, mom, last one. This is for you. Pastor, what if I'm not bringing a child? What if I'm bringing myself to the altar? God answers those prayers too. What if it ain't about me? I mean, what if it ain't about my children? What if it's me? What if I'm tired? What if I'm suicidal? What if I'm depressed? What if I'm terrified about having to raise these children? What, what about me? Yes, God answers the prayers about you too. And you've been scared to ask for yourself, but I pray that God will give you the courage and the boldness to ask for you. Ask for yourself. Would you join me in a time of prayer? As you're standing to your feet all around this auditorium, I want to pray for every Hannah. I want to pray for every person who's been praying for something for a long time. I want to pray that you'll keep praying. I want to pray that God will meet you in that place where your need is. I want to pray that God will break off the chains of depression and, and suicide and addiction and low self-worth and value. I pray that God will break the chain of loneliness off of you. Here's another one, the chain of regret. And while he's breaking those chains off of you, moms, I pray that he'll break them off your children, your grandchildren. That he'll put his blood between your yesterday, your today, and even out into your tomorrow. He'll put his blood out into the future generations of your family. And that they'll all experience the goodness of the Lord. Because there was a mom who would weep bitterly. There was a mom who was burdened. There was a man, a woman, there's a person who was burdened by the Lord. Burdened to pray. Burden to seek his face. Burden to keep those that they love on the altar of God. Now, Lord, every chain, every bit of bondage, every bit of pain that my brothers and sisters are feeling and experiencing, I pray that you'll lift a heavy burden right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Tell your neighbor now.